Cook. I'm Anthony Valeri, Director of Investment Management in Wealth and Fiduciary Services. With me is Robert Spendlove, our Economic and Public Policy Officer. Today, we will go over our thoughts on the economy and financial markets for 2022. And we'll begin uh, with Robert, and then I'll transition back. We should take about 25 minutes to give you our thoughts on the economy and financial markets. Thanks for joining, Robert. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Anthony. It's great to be with you today. <clears throat> so I just want to give a little bit of uh, overview of what we're seeing right now uh, with the economy and what and kind of uh, general what the, the Fed is really looking at. That's the big question. What is the Fed thinking? What are uh, individuals thinking? So if we just look at uh, the broad economy, uh, probably our broadest measure of the economy is gross domestic product, which you see here. And what kind of the takeaway from this slide is the economy is doing really well. Uh, if you look back before the recession, before the, the pandemic hit, our gross domestic product was at $21.7 trillion. And then you see that big drop uh, where GDP lost 30% in one quarter. But then uh, surprisingly to many, GDP came back very quickly. We, you can actually see that V-shaped recovery uh, in, the, uh, in GDP. And now we're back above where we were pre-recession uh, at $23.2 trillion. So that the economy is growing well, the economy is doing well. Uh, however, we go to the next slide, Anthony. So try telling that to consumers. Um, this is, there, there's this disconnect going on. Um, consumer confidence, even with the strong economy, is way down. Uh, this is a measure that the University of Michigan has been putting together uh, for decades. Uh, and you know, and it, it's kind of the gold standard of uh, consumer sentiment. And what you see is, uh, if you kind of jump back, look at the beginning of uh, 2020, we had very high consumer sentiment right around 100 on their measure. And we saw that big shock going into the pandemic. Uh, but then kind of a year ago, last year in 2021, uh, as the economy was reopening, as uh, businesses were reopening, people were coming back out, you saw that consumer sentiment starting to go up again. People were feeling good, but then we got hit again. Uh, and uh, you know, it's been kind of a, a combination of the uh, of COVID coming back, we've had two variants. Right now, we're in the middle of a a wave as uh, uh, in our society. And so you've seen that consumer confidence really dropping, and you see that in a number of different measures. So one of the big reasons for that, though, uh, next slide, is what we're seeing in the uh, in the job market. So there, if you kind of think about the Fed, uh, the Fed has what's called a dual mandate. They are mandated to focus on two things. They, they, they actually don't focus on uh, GDP. They don't focus on the markets. They focus on full employment and uh, uh, low and stable inflation. Uh, they call that price stability. So that's the dual mandate of the Fed, employment and inflation. <clears throat> so if we look at our employment picture, um, you know, we had kind of a miss. Um, we had lower growth than we expected last month. Um, however, on the other side, the uh, unemployment rate has been dropping very dramatically. In fact, last month, the unemployment rate uh, dropped more than we had expected from 4.2% uh, down to 39 So normally it's good to see the unemployment rate dropping. <clears throat> however, if you look at that shaded part, that's what represents full employment. We're now below the full employment level. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what we're seeing now is signs of a labor shortage. And we're seeing that all over the economy uh, that <clears throat> we just don't have enough jobs, or excuse me, we don't have enough uh, in, uh, people applying for jobs to keep up with demand. Next slide. So one of the results of this, if you just kind of think about your Econ 101, if we've got high demand for workers and a low supply of workers, it's pushing uh, those wages up. And uh, so while this is a great thing, at the individual level. Uh, it's great that we're seeing, especially low paid workers, seeing uh, strong pay increases. Uh, it is creating uh, real pressure. <coughs> Excuse me, it's creating real pressure on employers. Um, now, this, this number is 4.7%. I wanna give you a little bit of insight into what's happening uh, beneath the, uh, uh, underneath this data. Um, if we look at the month to month 
uh, wage growth. It was six tenths of a percent last month. So on an annualized basis, that wage growth is about 7%, 7.2%. Next slide. Which also uh, coincides very tightly with what we're seeing on inflation. Um, again, so the, 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 the Fed's dual mandate, right, is employment and inflation. Here's our inflation side. The Fed's preferred level is that red line across the middle. The Fed's aiming for inflation around two to two and a half percent. And that's been their goal for a long time. But what has happened to our inflation, you can really see that start to take off in early 2021, where we started to see those signs of inflation. We started to really see it uh, surging up. Now, we haven't seen that inflation peak yet. In fact, in the latest data, so, uh, the previous month, the inflation was at 6.8%. In our latest read, it was at 7%. So we're seeing these inflationary pressures throughout the economy. Um, you know, the Fed had a theory early on. They said this inflation is transitory or temporary. But what we're seeing now is that inflation is uh, proving to be much more widespread and also much more persistent. So then the next question is, what do we think will happen in the future? If you look at things like the producer price index, it is also showing more inflationary pressure, at least in the next few months. So what is the, what's the Fed's role been in this? So if you kind of go back to that dual mandate, <clears throat> excuse me, that dual mandate again, uh, the Fed was essentially focused on employment and that employment uh, uh, has been lower than they would like it to be. So, so the Fed has been uh, buying bonds on the open market. They've essentially been increasing their balance sheet, which is what we're looking at here. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet went from $4 trillion, around $4 trillion uh, before the pandemic to almost $9 trillion now. And then if you look at those kind of stair steps on the right, the Fed has been buying an additional $120 billion of assets per month, really until uh, last month. So the Fed, part of the Fed's pivot, uh, kind of the first part is with this balance sheet. Uh, Jerome Powell has said, because that inflation has been more persistent, because it's been surprising to them, they're gonna be uh, phasing out these uh, bond purchases, uh, tapering off this increase in their balance sheet. Uh, next slide. So the next step after the Fed uh, 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 tapers off their uh, bond buying is the Fed is going to start uh, raising interest rates. Now, the, the Fed really only uh, directly controls the federal funds rate, which is what we're looking at here. Now, the really interesting thing about this chart is, so uh, what I'm showing is the last four Fed meetings where they announced uh, interest rate changes. So you see March, June, <clears throat> September, and December. And then if you look at the, the 2022 graph, you see that in March and June of last year, the Fed you know, saw that inflation, but they thought it was temporary. So they said, we're gonna keep the federal funds rate at zero throughout all of 2022. By September, they started to acknowledge uh, the inflationary pressure that, that, that we're all seeing. And they said, okay, we're gonna raise rates one time in 2022. Well, by December, that's where the Fed really announced their pivot. And uh, by December, and the official kind of message from the Fed right now is now they're planning on raising rates uh, three times in the next year. Now, if you, uh, if you look at kind of market expectations, uh, there's a high probability that the Fed may have to raise rates even more than three times uh, over the next year. And it all depends on that inflation. If we continue to see that inflation going up or staying high, the Fed will have to be more aggressive with their interest rate policy. So kind of putting it all together. Um, so what I did was I color coded these. Uh, the green is a, a kind of a positive indicator. Red is negative and blue is neutral. So if we look at COVID, um, you know, right now it looks really bad. But one of the things we've seen with this variant is uh, it goes up very quickly, then it peaks and it could come down just as quickly. So I put that as kind of uncertain. We could be in a great position six months from now. Um, economic growth. You know, if you think back to that GDP slide, uh, economic growth is good. The economy is, is very strong right now. Job creation, um, it's increasing, uh, not as much as we'd like it to, but it's a good sign. It's still uh, moving up. The unemployment rate is dropping. Um, you know, uh, as recently as uh, 2020, you know, when the pandemic was hitting, we had unemployment at 15%. Uh, 
Uh, now we're much lower than that, so that's good. Uh, wage growth, I put this as, un, uh, as neutral. Like I said, it, it's great for the individual, but it is creating that inflationary pressure. Uh, our labor force participation, we're, we're still missing about 4 million people in the labor market. And for us to really recover the, the, our employment, we've got to get that labor force participation back up. Uh, consumer confidence uh, is, is down and we haven't seen it bottom yet. So that will be a, a negative drag on our overall economy. Inflation, um, like I said, uh, as long as that inflation continues to go up, that's going to be a, a struggle and is going to, uh, uh, you know, make more uncertainty in the economy. Uh, housing prices. We have seen some early, early signs that house prices may have peaked, uh, but they're still extremely high uh, around the country. And then interest rates, I put that as neutral. Um, now, you know, the, the problem is the Fed raising interest rates will slow the economy. Um, but it's the it's the right thing to do. I, I wish they would have done it uh, sooner, but they're, they're, but they're now doing it and and it is the right move for the Fed. Thanks so much, Anthony. All right, Robert, thank you for your views on the economy and I'll transition to our expectations on our outlook and financial markets. I'm gonna start first with a recap of 2021. A really good year for investors. Here's a variety of asset classes and their total return for 2021. A REITs, due to a strong fourth quarter, outperformed. I've highlighted in yellow the major U.S. stock benchmarks, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, and the Dow Jones Industrials. You can see they're on the left-hand side of the chart, which shows just how strong their performance was. And they obviously led performance across a variety of asset classes. In fact, Large cap stocks really dominated and the three year total return relative to other areas of the stock market like mid cap and small cap company stocks is the largest uh, since the late 90s. So uh, it was a year in which diversification didn't help investors uh, as much as it, it can, uh, but that doesn't mean you should chase that performance. We've seen a reversal so far in 2022, but still all in all a good year for investors International stocks were a uh, detractor, uh, but again, this year they've turned into a positive and outperformed U.S. So despite the strength in the major uh, U.S. indices, we wouldn't uh, change uh, our investment view. We remain diversified. Tough year for emerging market stocks and high quality bonds. Again, diversification from those two sectors did not help, but again, that is uh, helping so far in 2022. Robert discussed some of the challenges for the economy. There are a number of headwinds that factor into our outlook for financial markets in 2022. We do expect a mid-return total return for stocks for investors. That's a, a big slowdown uh, from 2021, but we do think stocks do better than bonds. And we do think that being diversified and staying invested is certainly the best course for investors, certainly beats being in cash. Let's start with some of those headwinds. And first, fiscal policy, the government is going to be spending less money in 2022 and also in 2023. Some of the big stimulus from COVID is now in the rearview mirror. It provided important support for the economy and financial markets and the economy. We still expect to grow above trend in 2022, about four, four and a half percent which should support uh, further gains in financial markets and equities, even though that spending is coming down. And you can see spending relative to the size of the economy, even with the potential passage of infrastructure legislation and a scaled down Build Back Better plan is going to be a lot less in terms of uh, spending relative to the economy than in 2020 and 2021. Now, I think fiscal policy is a secondary factor for investor, but it's still one we consider in expecting lower returns in 2022. So modest headwind there. We also have the Fed hiking rates, as Robert mentioned. It's all is not lost, however, when the Fed hikes rates, it's not the signal to abandon a diversified investment plan. In fact, when the Fed has hiked rate, if we look back at the last seven times they embarked on a rate hike campaign, the performance from stocks uh, six months after 
And even throughout the period, it was on average positive. You can see the performance at the bottom of this table after six months up 8.1%. I do want to call attention to the final four rows. That's from the 1990s on. I think that's more representative of how monetary policy was run and will be run in today's world. And you can see three months after in those four episodes, they were all negative. So it's certainly to be expected to have some volatility around Fed rate hikes. Again, however, the longer term stocks generally manage uh, to get through those rate hikes and revert back to their fundamentals and see additional gains. We we'll talked about inflation uh, earlier on the economic side. It's still a factor in financial markets, but again, stocks are still your best hedge against inflation. This is a chart I brought up in our third quarter review, and I still think it's relevant just as a reminder that although we have increases in CPI, that is not something new. If we look back over time, there have been numerous periods where the consumer price index, a measure for inflation, came off of a low and then subsequently accelerated. You can see all of the six prior periods there. And that change in CPI ranged anywhere from 2.4% cumulative up to 6%. The current episode is 6.9%. Inflation bottomed in May 2020, uh, but has since accelerated to 7%, but has also seen strong equity market gains over that time period. The average return, 8.9% annualized, uh, with only one of those showing negative returns. Even if we go back to the 70s, stocks, uh, tough uh, period for stocks, but they still provided uh, the best returns among asset classes uh, in investment markets. So it still uh, pays to be invested in stocks. They'll be managed to get through inflation and in the current environment have been able to pass, most companies have been able to pass those price increases all along. This is also a midterm election year, which has historically been more volatile for the equity market has also witnessed muted returns, at least through the first nine months of the year. This is the average monthly performance for the S&P 500 going back from 1946 through 2018. Again, you can see very muted returns over the first several months of the year before picking up or accelerating in October uh, in the fourth quarter, October, November, December. Uh, I should mention that uh, the 12 months following a midterm election have been positive every time going back uh, to 1940. 50. So it's a good omen longer term, but just to be aware that we do have some bumps likely along the road with these headwinds, midterms, Fed hiking rates, uh, and of course, less fiscal spending. So let's turn a little bit more to some of the specifics uh, of the equity market. Valuations are elevated. They remain most elevated in the U.S., uh, less so in developed markets, uh, developed international and in emerging markets, emerging markets and international cheap relative to US, but there's a reason for that. Economic growth has been stronger in the US and we've seen stronger profit growth. So we think that the valuations are a bit of an offset. We still remain diversified, but the real key to supporting valuations is earnings growth, which has been very strong uh, for several quarters now. The blue represents the consensus prior to the start of earnings, and we've just started fourth quarter 2021 earnings. And the yellow is the actual or what the results ultimately came in at. And since the second quarter of 2020, there has been a consistent pattern of actual results beating the consensus. In other words, earnings or profits have surprised to the upside. It has been the shining star for equity markets uh, in 2021, especially those beats have been quite significant. Uh, and for the full year, earnings are on track to grow almost 50% for the S&P 500. That is a banner, banner year. The expectation for 2022, and another reason to expect lower returns, is for 8% earnings growth. So we do think those valuations, those PE ratios come down, but they should be supported by what should still be strong earnings growth, 8% earnings growth, uh, a little bit above the historic average. So that'll be one to watch as the fourth quarter earnings season progresses. Uh, we'll watch for cost pressures, the ability of companies to pass those cost increases along or whether they're eating into profit margins. So far, companies have been able to pass that along, but should that become more problematic, we might have to revise the earnings outlook and could be a negative for stocks. But for the moment, I think earnings uh, do come in close to that 8% growth rate for 2022. Also, we've seen a bit of a change in the leadership in the stock market that I think is worth 
uh, being aware of and certainly we position portfolios uh, around this in on the value versus growth. Now, when we talk about growth, those are your typically your technology companies, your faster growing companies, and also a little more expensive, expensively valued companies, whereas value represents sectors like energy, financials, and more uh, cheaply valued. There's been a shift and that rising line means that value is outperforming growth within the small cap stock space. It started early in 2021. There was um, uh, into the large cap space that began in late 2020, it stalled out, reversed. But since November, both large and small cap value have really outperformed. So it's a reminder to stay diversified. It also shows you how leadership can change on a dime. And though the chasing some of the uh, hot investment fads might be trendy, uh, they're not working here early in 2022, actually since the end of November. So again, a, another reminder to stay diversified, make sure you have aspects or uh, exposure rather uh, to all corners of the market. We changed our value implementation in September to better take advantage of this trend in the equity market. So all put together, uh, we do expect lower returns in the equity market, uh, but we still actually increased our exposure to equities because of the lower returns we expect in, from the bond market. Now bonds still provide a very important diversification tool in investor portfolios. To give you an idea of what to expect, this chart shows the yield of the 10-year treasury uh, for, uh, forwarded 10 years in advance. And the blue, the yellow line rather shows the 10-year average or annualized return of the Bloomberg Barclays aggregate index. Now that index uh, is a 10-year average. So some years are higher, some years are lower, but you can see how that return closely tracks the yield. So if we look at that yield, we're looking at a 2% total return for high quality bonds going forward and we think we can do better especially as we have a long-term view when we invest we'll be looking over a five-year horizon we think stocks will provide that better uh, performance so as we look uh, also at fixed income markets and uh, positioning we remain defensive against rising interest rates it's because the fed has forecast uh, a fair number of rate hikes. In fact, as of this morning, the futures market pricing in almost four rate hikes for all of 2022 with the first one coming in March, just a dramatic change as we alluded to earlier in this webinar. You can see the Fed forecast in blue slightly below the market for 2022 and 2023. But wanted to call out the longer term expectations 2024 and also the long run, which is basically a five year horizon. Bond market still believes the Fed will have to stop right around 2% in terms of an overnight uh, lending rate, basically reflecting the big debt burden that has been assumed since the start of the pandemic. So an interesting uh, aspect of the markets to follow, will the Fed be able to raise rates beyond that, given the large debt burden? I don't think they'll be able to. And we're looking at, uh, although we are looking at rate hikes here over the next couple of years, don't think that we're looking at a surge in interest rates over the longer term. So we'll continue to update you on those uh, changes in market expectations. But bond markets uh, with a tough start to the year is priced in a lot in terms of rate hikes. In terms of other aspects of the bond markets, we eliminated our exposure to high yield bonds. We're getting more conservative in our bond allocation so that it can act as a true diversifier. If you're going to take risk, do it in the equity market. There's more upside there and use bonds as a diversifier. Here we're showing the yield advantage of high yield bonds relative to treasuries. And that is back not near an all-time low, but at the low end of a historical range, hovering right at 3%. Uh, and therefore, uh, the historical average is right around 4.7%. That gives you an expensive valuation for high yield bonds. So we are taking risk more on the equity side, not on fixed income. So a slight positioning change. We've gone to bank loans to incorporate a more uh, conservative allocation, uh, but all in all raising credit quality in our bond allocation. We'd like to conclude with two just uh, pragmatic reminders about investing. One, a, a reminder that volatility is, is normal and that going back to 1980, 70% of the time you will see positive total returns on the equity market, but almost all of those years has an intra-year peak to trough decline. In 2021, it was fairly minor, down just 5% uh, peak to trough, and that happened in September, despite the big gain. Also, look at the, those blue bars on the far right, 31, 16, and 29. Those are strong, strong returns. They're due to slow 
Uh, but just a reminder, when it's the market's only down five, uh, that is uh, less than usual. So if we do get volatility, remember, it is normal. It's a normal part of investing. So due for uh, a bit of a change in the calm that has been in the equity market over 2021, but we would not abandon investing, missing the best days and trying to time the market can be very, very costly. Always stay focused on your long-term goals. And this chart shows just what you'll lose in terms of performance, even if you miss a few days. So fully invested 8.3%, and this is through late 2020. But let, missing the five best is a 6.4% return. And then less 10 best, 5.1. And you can see how progressively worse performance goes as you stay out of the market. So important to remain invested. That concludes our Outlook webinar. Thanks very much for joining. Any questions, please reach out to your relationship manager in Wealth and Fiduciary Services. And we'll look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you very much. And we'll talk to you again soon. Have a great rest of the day.